And I really do see myself as just a girl from Barry who somehow had some quite interesting things happen to her. And that's simply by being curious, saying yes to opportunities when they present themselves, and refusing to take no for an answer. And I think that that is something that runs through the veins of any woman in science very, very strongly. So, a little bit about me. I am an only child. I'm the only child of two Cardiffians who made the grand leap to Barry some 40 years ago. And neither of my parents have a background in science. In fact, no one in my family does. I'm definitely the odd one out. And really, there's not that much academia in my family either. So I went to university. I've got a cousin who went to university. He's a head teacher. My mum did her degree later on in life related to her work. And I think there's a couple of second cousins who also went to university, but that's it. Both of my parents are now retired, and my dad did accounts for various authorities, and my mum was a payroll manager. And interestingly, it was my mother who was the main breadwinner of the family, if you sort of want to use that terminology, with my father taking on the major caregiving role in my early years, really up until I went to secondary school and so then he could return to work full time. And I do wonder that perhaps being immersed in this gender non-conformity right from an early age is one of the underlying drivers behind my confidence to pursue a career in STEM, because I never saw it as not an option. Being different in my family was normal. I'd also been encouraged to be curious and explore right from a young age. Okay, so sure, I played with makeup. I had the Barbie dolls, the My Little Ponies, or what you call the kind of girls' toys. But I also had a microscope. I had Lego. I had cars. I had an action man with a parachute that I would drop endlessly off the stairs trying to get him to float. It was never a big enough of a drop. I'm told as you already know now from the introduction, that when I was about two, these little noddy cars, which you know you're familiar with um, in this sort of formation, but apparently mine was noddy themed. I had one of these, most kids kind of pushed them around, but no, I turned it upside down and tried to take it apart with my plastic toolbox. I had toys because they were toys, not because they were made for girls. And I wonder if that helped too. As a kid, I spent hours exploring with my dad. This is by far the best fossil that we ever found on our fossil hunting adventures. We went blackberry picking, we had conquer battles. And I'm sure all of this guided an already inquisitive mind. Even more so perhaps, because I do have a physical disability. So I have something called mild cerebral palsy. And what this means is I have a tiny scar on my brain. Um, it's, it's caused by oxygen deprivation during birth, and it's just something that happens sometimes. And I'm largely okay day to day. It doesn't really affect my day to day life, but it does mean that the muscles on the right hand side of my body are weaker and tighter. And I do wonder if having this physical disability, so not able to maybe move around as easily and play a lot of the childhood games that always involve physical activity, I wonder if that encouraged me to use my mind more, to think, to wonder and ponder. And these are habits that stick with me today. But in terms of my journey into astronomy, well, I'm afraid to say that began in a very, very cliche way, and it was all thanks to my dad. So my dad always had a passionate interest in astronomy as a hobby. And when I was about eight years old, he showed me the moon through his ageing telescope. I'm sure we're all quite familiar with the moon in the sky, either a wonderful, beautiful crescent or that kind of circle on the sky. But the problem is you look with the naked eye and it really does look flat, 2D. It looks like a sticker on the sky. Seeing the moon through a telescope is simply transformative. It becomes another world. You can see valleys, mountains, craters, sunlight just glinting off their edges. 
When Galileo turned his newly crafted telescope on the moon in the early 1600s, its imperfections inspired him to consider our place in the universe. Because at the time, the Copernican model of the universe was only just starting to gain traction. So that is a sun-centered model of the solar system, of the universe. So all of the planets orbiting the sun. Prior to this, Earth had always been the center of our solar system, the center of the universe. When he looked at the moon, Galileo realized that just like Earth, the moon is not perfect. And so if the moon is imperfect and Earth is imperfect, does that mean that Earth is also a heavenly body, just as Copernicus proposed? The moon shifted Galileo's perspective, and it did very much the same for me four centuries later. Although, to be fair, I have not made quite the same dent in the world of astronomy that Galileo did, but it did change my world forever. I was completely hooked. So from that moment, I had to know what everything was up in the night sky. I learned that someone who studies space is an astrophysicist, and that was it. That's what I wanted to be. So I went to an all-girls secondary school called Bryn Havering in Barry. It no longer exists now. It's been merged with boys' school to create two new secondary schools. But while I was there, there was a study uh, published in 2005 by the Goodman Research Group. And it showed that graduates of all girls' schools are six times more likely to consider further education in STEM subjects compared to mixed schools. So perhaps this also helped me on my journey. I did my undergraduate degree and my integrated masters at Cardiff University. And for two reasons, really. They have an absolutely fantastic astronomy department. But you know what? I actually really value my friends and family. We always encourage students to move away for university. But I think there's something to be said for being near the ones that you love the most and who love you the most in return. I had some really great adventures during my undergraduate. The highlight was absolutely spending three months in Australia on an internship one summer. Yeah, it was a brilliant, brilliant adventure. And afterwards, I was still in love with astronomy, and I stayed on to do my PhD at Cardiff as well, where I studied the evolution of gas and dust in galaxies over cosmic time. Now, galaxies, are the largest structures in the, are the largest structures in the universe, the largest objects, and they come together to form extraordinary groups and clusters and superclusters. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes and types, and they are amazing. They are truly exquisite. One particularly striking example of a spiral galaxy, which are, of course, the most beautiful galaxies in existence, is this one. It's known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's also known as M51 or Messier 51. And you'll find it in the constellation of Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs. Alternatively, if you're familiar with the asterism of the plough or the Big Dipper, it's just below the star at the end of the handle of the plough. So you can kind of look up at the night sky and know that this beautiful galaxy is sitting there just out of view from the naked eye. The center of this galaxy is yellow. And that's because it's dominated by the light of older, smaller stars, like the sun. Ancient bodies that have lived for billions of years. And right in the heart of this core is a supermassive black hole with the mass of a million suns. We can't see it here, but it's hidden there. Swirling outwards from the centre are two beautiful spiral arms. And these are blue because their light is dominated by that coming from the most massive, newly formed stars. They're extraordinarily hot and that's why they appear blue. In there you can also see glowing pink. Those are clouds of hydrogen gas already forming new jewels for this galaxy. And snaking through those spiral arms are dark cosmic dust lanes. Now, cosmic dust is produced by stars at the end of their lives. 
is made up of heavier elements and they return this enriched material to their host galaxy. And it is from this enriched material the rocky planets like our Earth form, and it is also where we find the ingredients for life itself. Now, with the light that we can see now with our own eyes, well, that cosmic dust seems quite the nuisance. It's in the way. But if we peer into the infrared, light that's invisible to our eyes, but not to our detectors, then we can actually start studying the emission from this cosmic dust itself. We can reveal a secret history of stars long lost, stars that died and returned this material to their host galaxy. Now, other galaxies are basically gigantic balls of stars, they're known as elliptical galaxies. And all of the stars within them are orbiting in all sorts of different directions. They're kind of shaped like a football or maybe even a rugby ball. And these galaxies are ancient and dead. They've lost their purpose because a galaxy's job is to convert gas into stars. But these galaxies have very little to no gas left at all. But how do we get to these red and dead ellipticals? We don't know. Because we live in a dying universe. With every millennia that passes, galaxies are producing fewer and fewer stars. We don't know why. The only way to find out is to study the material from which the stars form and the material that the stars produce when they die. So the gas and that wonderful cosmic dust. And that's what my PhD was all about. I dabbled in some other projects as well, so I went out to South Africa to study exoplanets. These are planets that orbit stars other than the sun. And while I was out there looking with the naked eye into the heart of our galaxy, I witnessed my shadow by starlight. And that is something truly remarkable that you never forget. For as much as I loved researching and being that person for a brief moment who knows something about the cosmos, that no other soul on this planet does. I actually realise I love talking about space and science, my own research and other people's research more. And so now, that's what I do as my career. I am an astronomer, but I am also a science communicator. And in my work as an astronomer and a science communicator, I get to meet some interesting people. And at the end of last year, I was truly honoured to interview one of my heroes of astronomy, Dame Jocelyn Val Bernal. And she inspires me for many reasons, because she did incredible science very early on in her career, and she's still going strong today. I mean, she is approaching 80, and she's still doing active research, so I hope that I am as switched on as she is when I get to my advanced years. She made one of the most important discoveries in the history of astronomy and astrophysics. She discovered pulsars, which were only a crazy theoretical idea at the time. Now, pulsars are the densest stars in the universe. They are created when a massive star dies in a supernova explosion. Now, they are tiny. They are comparable in size to a city. And yet, in that space, they cram the mass of two, even three suns. They spin rapidly and they have powerful magnetic fields. And this drives enormous jets of radiation emanating from their poles. And these radiation jets sweep across us like a lighthouse beam from deep space. We see them blinking in the darkness. And that's how we find them. Now Jocelyn helped build the radio telescope. She was the one who read the readout. She was the one who discovered their signal. But it was her supervisor that got the Nobel Prize, not her. In our interview, we of course talked about astronomy and astrophysics and her wonderful career, but we actually spent a significant amount of time talking about being a woman in STEM. And I asked her what I thought would be a very easy question to answer. I said, I find you very inspiring. And I'm sure lots of other people do too. 
But I'd actually like to ask you about the people who inspired you and who your champions have been throughout your career. Her answer broke my heart. For she said, I struggle there because I don't think there's been many. There have been people who tolerated, but that's not quite the same thing, is it? I was tolerated in the physics course and at PhD level, but for most of the time that I was at Cambridge in the 60s, I was the only woman in science there. In the department, there were some secretaries and some computing assistants, but I was the only female researcher. So I've been in a minority most of my life. It's got much, much better, but we're not quite there yet. There are still issues. There are still too few women. It's getting better all the time, and we're getting a better understanding of what's going on, but we're not there yet. And this really made me think about how some things have changed and some things have not. So I think back to my undergraduate degree, and I never had a single problem with any of my professors. I don't feel like I was ever treated differently because I was a woman in science. Not in Jocelyn's day, because she was tolerated. Whereas I was welcomed, even celebrated, by giving, being, being given awards for academic achievement and also for my efforts in science communication. But there were problems with my peers. I was told many years after completing my degree that some of the boys, and I am going to call them boys because what they did was so obnoxiously childish, they would rate the women on a scale of one to ten as we walked into the lecture theatre. It's not quite as bad as Jocelyn say when, and I quote, there was a tradition when women walked into the lecture theatre, all the guys whistled, called, stamped their feet and banged the desk. This barrage, each time you walked into the lecture theatre. And in classes where there were several women, we'd congregate outside the lecture hall and walk in together, but being the only female doing honours physics. I had to walk in on my own. When I heard about this rating system, I was really surprised because these were my peers. They'd been brought up on the same gender equality ideas and talks that I had, presumably. Well, maybe not. But then I was thinking about how Jocelyn said she was the only woman in her department, the only female researcher in science, let alone astronomy, at her day in Cambridge. My PhD team, we were cosmic dust. And we were three PhD students and a master's. We then had a postdoc, we had two more senior researchers, and then Professor Hayley Gomez, who was our grant winner and she set up the research subgroup itself. All of the PhD students were women, as was the master's student. Half of the rest of the research team were also women. And that was extraordinarily empowering. It was a wonderful environment to be a part of. Jocelyn felt alone. Where well, I don't feel that today. We have a ladies what science is group chat and we champion each other in our PhD lives and beyond. So we talk about new job opportunities, we celebrate promotions, we celebrate when people have got new jobs, and crucially, we always talk about our salaries. We are not just surviving in STEM. We are thriving. And by we, I don't just mean the ladies what science is. I mean all of us in this room today and even beyond. I know that the numbers are not equal yet. And I know that there are not enough women in the highest paid positions and far too many leave STEM after they've had children because they feel forced out. These and more disparities, I do not deny. But look how far we've come 
from Jocelyn's day. Now earlier, I referred to myself as just a girl from a seaside town who saw the stars and lost her heart to them. But I am so much more. Like Jocelyn, like you. I am the girl who dared. I dared to dream, to be curious, to be true to myself, and say yes when others said no. To be that girl from a seaside town who's sometimes on the telly talking about stars for other girls in seaside towns to see and believe is truly an honour. It is a privilege to be part of the explosion of women in STEM and I cannot wait to see where this rocket to the stars takes us. Thank you. I have told you to stop clapping. Keep clapping. Man, that, that was good. Did you enjoy that? Wasn't that really inspirational? I, I thought it was fantastic. You know, when, when you just tell us me, to be honest with you, and you get a, a speaker who's got a PhD, you desperately look for something in what they say that you can, really, you can identify with. And thank goodness you said something that I did in my life as well. I too had an action man with a parachute. <laughs> and I took him down and stuff like that, so. Uh, talk to Jenny Millard, everyone.